before we get started, I wanted to share a few pieces of information with you. First, where you are, right? Well, where is this place? These are the premises of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness. The Council is the founder of a different, separate organization, the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. I do work for the Global Federation. We are represented on the ground today, 35 different nations. The GFCC is a multi-stakeholder organization. We have <coughs> four types of members today. Private sector councils, like the U.S. Council, government agencies, we have corporations as members and universities, a group of 40 universities coming from 20 different nations today. In addition to our membership, we have an expanding cadre or group of thought leaders that are our GFCC Global Fellows. I'm happy to have two of them here. They will be uh, presenting. They are former ministers, prime ministers, heads of uh, government agencies, uh, and senior like executives, uh, thought leaders like Benny and, and Fred. <coughs> so what we do in the GFCC, the GFCC was created to be a hub, a facility for organizations in the innovation competitive space to be in contact, to share information, to share best practices. We do that through conversations and gatherings like this. We have an annual summit that goes around the globe. We have some analytical tools to support countries to assess performance across a variety of competitiveness metrics. If you want to check that, please go to our website and check the competitiveness decoder. We've been advising some initiatives around the globe, and we also have something that's the Global Competitiveness Academy, an innovation initiative. Every year, as I said, we have our Global Innovation Summit. It goes around the globe. When we were in Malaysia in 2017, the conversation was about the sustainable future of production, consumption, and work. Last year, 2018, we were in Argentina, and we talked about scaling up innovative solutions and innovative companies. And this is really connected to the topic of our conversation today, food. And why food? I want to highlight four aspects to you. First is that we need to double food production in the globe in the next 50 years. That's a big challenge, but also a big opportunity for business, innovation, new technologies. The second thing is that more and more we see all sectors and industries becoming high-tech. It does not make sense anymore to think about low-tech or high-tech industries. We can think about maybe high-tech and low-tech products, but all industries are really becoming high-tech, including food production, and we'll be talking a bit about that. The third thing is that we see a hybridization really involving more business and serv services and manufacturing and food production and all those things become mixed. We also see a bit of that today. And finally, it's about sustainability. This is something, and I mentioned 2017, the things that we're doing and exploring with you because it's pretty clear that sustainability is a competitive issue. Not a single country, nation, city, region will be able to bear the costs of let's say, unsustainable practices because that will really subtract value from society. At the same time, sustainability is a big business opportunity for us to create new things, to create the business of the, the future, to create the technologies of the future. What's our agenda today? We have a presentation, like 25, 30 minutes. Then we will open for questions and comments coming from, from the floor. So please have your uh, questions prepared. Having said that, I really want to introduce our two GFCC fellows, um, very uh, distinguished thought leaders from uh, the United States, but with a global footprint. Footprint or footprint? Maybe oh both, God. right? <laughs> so um, I have here to my left Professor Fred Davies, who's a Jet Regents Professor Emeritus at Texas A&M, a former science advisor to the USAID. Fred has more than 40 years of experience in food, technology, agriculture, and um, horticulture, plant propagation, and other topics. He has worked extensively around the globe in more than 25 countries, and he um, worked as a professor researcher in a variety of organizations. His research has been supported by a variety of uh, different bodies, including NASA, 
And I think that food production in the space will be a critical issue for us going forward more and more. This is something that we should all have in perspective. To the left of Fred, I have Dr. Benny Benning Garrett. We're sort of probably about you the same are, place. Yeah. yeah. Benny is a Washington exiled uh, <coughs> thinker, yeah, um, coming here from California. Uh, 39 years ago. 39 years ago. He's a thinker, writer, uh, researcher, and has been working on topics related to national security, China relations, and global trends for several years. He's an advisor to a variety of multilateral global organizations. We're happy to have uh, Benny as one of our fellows. He was the founding director of the Atlantic Council Strategic Foresight Initiative. He was a director of the Atlantic Council's Asia program back uh, in from 2003 to 2012. And he has, if I'm not wrong, more than 60, uh, 70 trips on record to China starting um, in the 70s. Um, Benning is once again, has been working on a variety of things, but brings this future-looking perspective and foresight <coughs> to our GFCC community. Before I turn to you, I want to thank the people who really helped us to put this together. Since the report and editing the report, my colleague Yasmin Hilper, Policy and Engagement Director at the GFCC, and Joanna uh, Saver, who's not here today yet, but also our colleagues at the Council, Marcy, Tanisha, Josh, everybody who has helped us to set this up. As we all know, it's very hard to make anything happen from the most simple thing to the most complicated. So thank you so much for your work and support. And it's my pleasure to turn to you, Fred and Ben. Thank you, Roberto. And I really want to thank the GCC, everybody from Deborah Wynn Smith to uh, of course, Roberto and Yasmin and Joanna, I mean, just an incredible team. And if you look at the report, it's really an amazing job of design and, and the production. Hopefully the content's worth it, but in any case, the design really looks good. So they did an amazing job, in, and on timeline, too. I want to add that. That's unusual in Washington. So it was very, very good. Um, I do have, I, I think that my uh, credentials as a foresight person are demonstrated by having partnered up with uh, Fred on this project since he's the real horticulturalist. He's the one who actually is the real expert. Um, I consider myself something of a global only expert. I try to, I've covered long term global trends for a long time and uh, tried to look at the bigger picture and assess uh, the impact on, uh, especially of technology on that picture. So just to, explain how we got to this project because as I said I'm not the food expert at all it's Fred I've been deeply concerned as probably most people in this room about the the confluence of, of, of climate change and where we see that going the impact it will have and my concern about looking down down the long term at the confluence of the long-term global trends especially climate change as a, as a force multiplier making everything even harder but looking at, at uh, you know, the population growth, adding two billion plus people to the planet in the next uh, uh, 20 years, 30 years, by 2050. And looking at these long-term trends and wondering where we're going, uh, what really struck me is that uh, we need to move to a more uh, a global economy, really, that is more sustainable and, and more local. So what I was really seeing was possibility of moving to what I call peak globalization, but essentially a point at which the amount of physical stuff moving around the world starts to peak and decline, and we produce more and more food, energy, and manufactured products at the point of consumption, where they're actually going to be consumed, which is basically in cities. So, and we're adding two billion in global population, and it's all going to be in cities net, and virtually all of that will be in the developing world. So how do we do that? So. Part of what I was thinking is we need to figure out how to move towards this kind of production system and that it's possible. That's where technology is taking us, certainly with renewable energy. You're not importing the sun. You're not importing the wind. And uh, as I like to say, the fuel is free forever, which is a pretty good deal. Um, and then if you move to more and more production of food, which became the concern, the quality and the um, quantity of food where it's consumed rather than 
moving food around the world and all the carbon emissions and all the implications of that, and you become more resilient. And then ultimately, the other piece of this is really in manufacturing with 3D printing and additive manufacturing, other aspects. You can produce actually more and more products where they're actually consumed. So you move files around the world, SDL files, you move ideas, you move people, you move huge amounts of data, but less physical stuff. So the, the, that really led me to the whole question of, of food and talking with Fred and decided, God, it was about two years ago we started working on this project, right? So we wanted to figure out how could we really improve the efficiency and the quantity of food being produced in, the, in a uh, global system that's going to be increasingly constrained by uh, well, a whole set of factors, including just a, a desertification, a, a fa you know, a drought, uh, urbanization taking up more and more land, uh, and of course climate change making everything harder and more difficult and water constraints, it's energy constraints. At the same time, as I said, you're going to add two billion people, so how are you going to feed them? How are you going to do this? And the middle classes, especially rising, as they say, demanding better food, more food, higher quality food, more protein. So this is really the problem. How are we going to do this? And so that we wanted to look at it and figure out how we could you know, really advance the food ecosystems really drawing on the technology that is now here now and will be there in the future uh, and see that if we can make much more efficient production and distribution of food and increase the quantity that's actually produced in cities. So we're, we've looked at this set and, and uh, Fred will go into that uh, momentarily, uh, the different technologies, but keeping in mind these are just tools that the uh, ultimate issue is people and how they use the technology, uh, how it, it actually uh, uh, builds into business models and all that. But we thought, if it, as uh, Roberto said, all this technology is being applied everywhere. And one of the things that really struck me when I started looking at this, I was at a conference in Dublin where I was speaking, and a woman from Agritech UK mentioned that she'd been down in, in um, the Sub-Saharan Africa and went to, to a village where she met with an illiterate um, farmer who had a smartphone with all these little icons on it, could walk through his crops and it would tell him where he need to put fertilizer or, or uh, pesticides or more water. So he's used the most advanced technology in the world he couldn't even read. But this technology is, of course, becoming incredibly democratized and ubiquitous and more and more user friendly. So it, it shows that we have the potential that's really transformative in this ubiquitous, democratized technology we're seeing uh, across many, many areas. I think we identified basically 11 plus drawing on old technologies and putting them together. So I wanted to turn that over to, to Fred and thank the GFCC for really this whole event and thank all of you for coming out on the, in Washington. It's, it's not easy to get away from where you're working and it's a, a, a really terrific group here. So, right, Fred. Well, hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, I'm, I'm passing around uh, some almonds I would, from California. I would like for you to take a couple of them and uh, munch on them, and we'll talk about almonds and water in a, yeah, it's a, good reason for that. In, in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Roberto and Jasmine and the GFCC for the, the support we got in putting this, this re report together, and also the ideas we got from the GFCC in, in general. So that was much appreciated and everything. Um, you all have a... You all have a handout that we've given you. It's just a one-pager, and I'm going to be going through some of the uh, the, uh, the urban food and uh, ecosystem, which we've labeled here the rural urban food value chain. And I'm also going to be talking about 12 technology platforms that we've also outlined too. Uh, I'm not going to go through every one of those, but I'm going to give you some examples in some of the uh, some of the slides slides I go through. Um, uh, we're going to end this presentation actually with uh, basically a, a summary of takeaways and recommendations that we've put together, and Banning will, will go through some of those. And then also, too, one of the things we'd really like to get from you guys is uh, your feedback and input from the standpoint of scaling this up. Where do we take it to? Where do we take it to the, uh, the next level? And we're very, we're very open to ideas on that. Um, <clears throat> let me get this to work. There's a, there's a lack of, of, of really a sense of urgency going on right now. Um, if you think about what's going on in West Africa, for instance, it's doubling its population within the next 20 years. Two of the six largest cities are going to be in West Africa and Central Africa. Uh, uh, 
productivity in agriculture has been straight line. It's been flat line in, in Africa for the last 20 years. They use some of the lowest inputs in the world. Uh, there's no way they can feed themselves now. They sure as hell are not going to be able to feed themselves in 20 years. And so things are really going to hit the fan, fan down the road unless we do some things differently. Only 5%, only 5% of agricultural production lands are actually irrigated. And that's a recipe for disaster uh, when it comes to global change, uh, when it comes to productivity. I work in horticulture. That's high value fruits, vegetables, and flowering plants. There's no way we can grow good horticultural crops without reliable irrigation systems. So that's going to have to dramatically change. And we have some, we have some things on the shelf which are available, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. All right, <clears throat> um, food. Uh, a lot of times we don't think about this, but only, only about 55% of the food we actually produce actually gets eaten by humans. <clears throat> the other 45% other goes to stuff like uh, ethanol production from corn, which we really should not be subsidizing. Uh, it also goes for animal stock as well, too. So there are a lot of these issues that are going on with food as well, too. And some other numbers here, too, like 65% of, of African labor is really businesses are really dependent on agriculture. So that's a whole bunch of people who are dependent on agriculture. And we need to be looking at ways, for instance, to increase the efficiency. And USAID the AID doesn't like to hear this, but we need to be thinking about pushing people in, out of farming into doing other things as well, too. And we also, what we're talking about in the urban food ecosystem is actually allowing people who, as entrepreneurs who never grew up in agriculture <clears throat> to start to take a role in the actual food ecosystem. If you think about it also, too, one out of eight people in the world is nutritionally at risk, goes to bed hungry at night. And actually, we're the wealthiest country in the world. One out of eight Americans is on food assistance in this country. They're in the SNAP program, so they're also uh, nutrition and, and food insecurity is a huge problem in this country as well, too. Having said that, there's some opportunities here as well, too. There's a food revolution that's going on in the world. People are really interested in food. It's an opportunity, for instance, of developing uh, new, new opportunities down, down the node, for instance, of presenting new, new foods. My wife is Peruvian, so there's a big interest in Andean food as an example. In, in East Africa, for instance, they, they tend to overcook. They have wonderful indigenous vegetables. They tend to overcook them. There's an opportunity for the Anthony Bourdains of the world to show how to go ahead and present food in a different format that makes it very attractive and, most importantly, very nutritious. So those are downstream opportunities also in this urban food ecosystem we're talking about. Um, we're going urban. Uh, we've gone from 3% in, in 1800 to we're going to be two-thirds urban by 2050. Latin America is already 80% urban. Texas, where I come from, is 85% urban. It's more urban than Britain is. So the urbanization process is something that's going to, it's one of those megatrends that's going to continue to increase. There are people leaving rural areas for urban areas. And we see a lot of opportunities, for instance, in the urban food ecosystem. There are a lot of challenges. There is a billion people living in urban slums right now. And if we don't do a better job, we're going to have more problems with that later on down the road. So essentially what we're doing is we're adding two Tokyos per year uh, uh, in terms of population-wise. And the net, net growth of that is going to be in urban city areas. <clears throat> This rural urban food value chain, and this is with this handout you've got, so it's a little bit easier. I know it's kind of difficult to read it from here. One of the things I want to emphasize about agriculture, agriculture is a business, and that's the way we need to be looking at it. Uh, it's, it's not development projects. This, this is a business that the, the ecosystem is set up uh, where if it's really going to be sustainable, and when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about really three, three pillars of sustainability. Uh, one of those is environmental, which of course is incredibly important, but the other one is economic. It's got to be economically sustainable, and the other thing too is socially sustainable. A quarter of the world, for instance, eats insects regularly. That's not appealing to some groups in the world as well too, so there's a social aspect of this as well too. Algae would be a great crop, except a lot of people don't like it, so there's social acceptability of things. So looking at the actual uh, 
the chain itself, we're, we're going basically from, from basically the production into things, and we use the word sustainable intensification, sustainable intensification. And what that means is we have to be a heck of a lot more efficient in how we do things. We're, we're running out of land. We have to use water better. We have to use uh, nutrients for the soil. We have to use pesticides more, more smart than we are right now, what we call best management practices. So there are a lot of opportunities in that area. Post harvest is a really important area. Um, over a, a, third of the, a third of the food, for instance, in the developing world, and sometimes even higher percentages, is lost during post harvest, which is unexcusable losses. And we need to find ways of improving that, and we can do that. Processing is a huge opportunity as well, too, as the world becomes more urban. Uh, people are looking for food that is simple, it's easier to eat, and we have wonderful opportunities of actually nutrifying those, those products to make it, make it cheaper, cheaper, better. Transportation is a huge problem in the developing world. A billion people, a billion people in the world do not have access to an all-weather road. Just imagine the logistics of trying to tr trans transport a uh, product when you don't have that. And then markets distribution. Our end customers are basically consumers, restaurants, and other businesses. And we look at the production locations for being rural, peri-urban, and urban, and the markets being urban and peri-urban. And then we have the whole sustainable intensification production systems from field production, which is basically mineral soil, to using low, low technology inter interventions, which would be something like poly hoop houses, which allow a grower to go ahead and extend their growing season, uh, to plastic culture, to rooftop gardens. And then we get into more sophisticated controlled environment agriculture, uh, such as greenhouses, hydroponics, aeroponics, and now we're talking about vertically producing crops. We don't necessarily have to use mineral soil. We can use aeroponics, hydroponics. There's a lot of cool ways we can grow stuff. The question is, it's got to be economically viable in doing that. In putting this together with banning, uh, one of the things we, we approached this from was that technology is not a panacea. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. It has to be well integrated. There has to be mentorship. There has, there has to be microfinance. There has to be a whole bunch of components that this is really going to be upscaled and, and, and taken up. So from a holistic approach, we're looking at the nexus of food, water, energy, nutrition, medicine, human health, uh, sanitation, education. All of this is very intertwined, and that's the way we need to approach these things. So looking at the 12 platforms, uh, we have this wonderful opportunity now of connectivity uh, with the cell phones, that, that cell phones and smartphones that we have. And that's changing the world very rapidly. Um, mobile money is a good example, for instance. In Kenya, uh, Kenya is the number one country in the world for using mobile money. Uh, over 48% of their GDP actually goes through mobile money now. So that's how technology is really leapfrogging a lot of things where people don't have traditional banks to work with. It's an uber world as well, too, and I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, precision agriculture, GPS systems, that's dramatically changing things. Artificial intelligence. Uh, we have really cheap now sensing technologies that we can put in the soil, and, and those soil sensors can, 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 be, can be programmed to the cloud to go ahead and indicate when's the best time to go ahead and water. Uh, controlled environment agriculture is another platform as well, too. Blockchain, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, is another area. 3D printing. Uh, solar and wind, ener wind energy, it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper uh, to go ahead and, and, and get solar pumps now. So those, those are some opportunities here. Enhanced quality seed is something that's very important. It's something that's overlooked. And then um, enhanced genetics. Um, there are there's systems like CRISPR, for instance, where with CRISPR, for instance, it, it, it's basically modern molecular biology, but it avoids the problems of bringing in foreign genes. Foreign genes is when we talk about GMOs. So there are wonderful opportunities of using CRISPR with traditional breeding and selection programs to go ahead and produce drought-resistant crops, uh, higher yielding crops, crops which have resistances to certain insects and pests. And then biotechnology is another wonderful area as well, too. The microbiome, uh, you've all known that we all have a gut microbiome. Well, plants also have a microbiome in the soil. That's an opportunity, for instance, of using organic fertilizers, of going ahead and increasing plant resistance to pests and what have you and pathogens, wonderful areas in that area. And then nanotechnology, which I'll talk about a little bit. And then number 12 is low technology. And, and you know, Roberto's talking about high tech, and I, and I certainly am in favor of that. But we have an opportunity of using something like 
Drip irrigation, which is not rocket science, it's been around for over 50 years, but totally underutilized and something where we could take drip irrigation, we could go ahead, we could use these sensors, they could be hooked to the cloud, uh, we can more efficiently use irrigation and we're going to have to start doing that. We're going to have to get a lot smarter in that area. Communications technology, 70% of us have access to the cell phone and that's really opened up so many opportunities for so many people. A billion people in the world use Facebook. Uh, Indonesia, where I was working, uses there are more Facebook users than Indonesia than here, and that's opening up a lot of a lot of opportunities and businesses. Digital Green is an example of a company which basically they'll 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 take very uh, low cost technology, basically video a video system. It's about 150 bucks, and what they do is they go in a place like India or Africa or Central America, and what they'll do is they'll go ahead they'll film their alpha farmer who's really using good agricultural practices because they don't trust somebody like me coming in. They want a local guy who's actually out there, boots on the ground, who's actually doing this. They want to see the technology. Farmers want to kick, kick, kick the tires to make sure that it's going to work before they go ahead and do that. And so what they do is they basically, this is a wonderful way of getting extension information out there. We, we have this wonderful land grant system in this country, which is way too expensive for other people to try and duplicate in other parts of the world. Brazil has, has a great land grant system as well, too, I might add, with Embrapa. But anyway, long story short is these, there, are, there are really private-public uh, partnership opportunities really disseminating stuff. Shamba Shapa, for instance. Shamba is Swahili for small farm. And these guys actually get to about 10 million people in Tanzania and also in Kenya. So as an example, for instance, uh, they were doing a piece on, on sweet potato, which is highly nutritious and everything. They had SIP, which is the International Potato Center, help them with the technology that they needed. And they produced a number of shows showing how to go ahead and, and, and propagate it, how to go ahead and plant it, how to, how to harvest it, how to process it and what have you, but they do it in an entertaining way that gets to a lot of people. So we need to be thinking out of the box of how we get information out there. It's an uber world. Uh, one of the things we need to start doing is, is getting the drudgery out of farming. Mechanization is totally underused in the developing world. We're trying to attract new entrepreneurs. And a new entrepreneur in the urban food ecosystem does not want to be carrying a jerry can full of water or hoeing, hoeing ground. And so we have wonderful opportunities, business to business opportunities. Uh, the Uber Eats that you guys are all familiar with here in, in DC, well hell, there are Uber Eats and a whole bunch of other companies that have developed in India and, and Nigeria and, and gone and what have you. So this is mushrooming all over, all over the world. But here's Hello Tractor, which is basically the Uber of tractors for, for small tractors, badly needed in the developing world to help plow somebody's field, to help harvest. Uh, these tractors are hooked up to the cloud, so basically I can go ahead, I can, I can set up for the Uber, trapper, Uber tractor to come in and, and go ahead and plow my, my, my ground. The, the payment is made with mobile, mobile money. Uh, it's just a very streamlined way of going ahead and taking, taking advantage of the technology that's, that's available. All right, we throw a third of the food away that we produce. We either throw it away or we lose it. And that's unacceptable. It's not acceptable. I mean, we're, we're losing all this water, which we've got problems with. We're losing all the nutrients and all the other energy that went into producing these foods. So we have a great opportunity of being able to go ahead and become more efficient in how we do this. And again, as, as it points out here, that's enough to feed 2 billion people. Um, for instance, misshapen fruit, for instance, if it's not, if it doesn't have a number one, one uh, category to it, it ends up being a cull, it ends up being thrown away. So there are companies which have, have cropped up in Perfect Protus, which some of you might be familiar with, but there are a number of other companies around the world as well, too, where basically what they do is they, they set things up with the producer. So rather than the producer junking, junking the crop, uh, they can go ahead, they can, they can pick it up, they can transport it to the consumer. The consumer buys it for a much more reduced price. It's totally nutritious. It's got the same nutrition that a number one standard would have of a fruit or a vegetable. And uh, the farmer's also making money on this as well, too. So it's a win-win. We can get a lot smarter in how we do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, disruptive technologies. Um, vertical farming. 
this is really cool stuff and uh, people say well vertical farming is the way we're going to feed the world the world is full of niches when it comes to agriculture and production system this is just one niche and that's going to be for greens and high value vegetables serving high value restaurants that's happening in the developing world because the walmarts the car fours are all over there looking for locally sourced product which has the quality that they're looking for but you cannot produce uh, you can't produce, for instance, uh, grains, grains economically, nor can you produce fruit crops of this. So again, it's a world of niches, but there are wonderful opportunities in this area. And the, one of these opportunities, for instance, that dramatically reduces water, water, and, and uh, there's no pesticide usage in this as well, too. 3D printing, and Banning's been involved with this for a long time, is a way that's really going to change things. Uh, 3D printing really gives us the opportunity of being able to go ahead and, and for instance, take food that might have been thrown away, uh, to go ahead, if somebody has a dietary issue, to go ahead and produce that food. The Culinary Institute of America is using this. Hershey's uses this. Uh, the next 20 years, you guys are going to have a 3D printer in your kitchen, just like you have a microwave right now. So that's how the technology is changing things. Um, also, too, parts is a huge problem in the developing world. Getting tractor parts, for instance, is a big problem. And uh, Boeing, for instance, with its Dreamliner uh, for titanium parts, spends about three million bucks uh, using using 3D printing for that as well too. So, 3D printing is going to really open up a lot of opportunities for us. Blockchain technology. Um, a billion people in the world don't have ID. They don't have a legal ID. You can imagine how difficult it is to do business if you don't have a lie, have have an ID. Uh, you can imagine how difficult it is to get a bank loan. So, so that's something, for instance, the UN is very much interested in. Uh, Mojo Loop, which is a, this blockchain-powered uh, mobile payment system, um, that's something the Gates Foundation has been involved in doing. And again, what they're doing is they're setting this up so that there'll be more robust systems in the developing world that will make things cheaper, better, easier for folks to go ahead and, and get microloans. Microloans are a huge problem, uh, having the resources to be able to go ahead and do, do things. Food safety is another area as well too, like um, <clears throat> Walmart for instance is, is using blockchain technology as a way of being able to trace their, their foods from a safe, safety standpoint. People in the world are going to expect that stuff is, is safe, they're going to expe expect also that it's sustainably produced, and blockchain will offer a lot of opportunities in being able to enhance those opportunities. Those are also business opportunities. All right, nanotechnology. Um, Again, we have this problem with the coal chain in the developing world. Reliable electricity, poor transportation systems, perishability of fruits and, fruits and vegetables and what have you. So there's new technologies which are coming up now which allow us to go ahead and coat products so that that actually goes ahead and enhances the shelf life, actually enhances the nutrition to keep it for a longer period of time. In plant propagation, for instance, we will use nano, uh, nano, nanotechnology, for instance, in coating seeds to go ahead and then enhance uh, longevity of the seed, also to enhance germination. So there are wonderful opportunities with nanotechnology down the road. And again, what we're presenting with these 12 platforms, this is just a snapshot right now, today, 2019. What's it going to be like five years from now? And the changes, the technological changes. Think about, think about that iPhone. The iPhone's only been around for 12 years. Just think about all the apps and billions of dollars of new businesses which were created in the last, in the last 12 years because of that. All right. Um, I shouldn't say this coming from Texas, but we eat too much beef. We actually <laughs> eat 40% more beef now than we did in the 1940s. And look at the health and the obesity problems we have and everything. Also, too, when it comes to a bioreactor, cows and beef are not very good bioreactors. And by that, I mean converting, conversion, conversion of feed to protein. It's about 15 to 1. If you talk about hogs, it's about 6 to 1. Chickens is about 5 to 1. If you talk about, talk about uh, um, fish, it's about 2 to 1. And I hate to bring this up, but insects is, is the most efficient source of protein we got. And people will say, ah, no way. But... Think about you know generational type things, and if you make if you make things tasty, it's, and 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 it's cost it cost wise it's, it it's, it it meets the marketplace. There are opportunities there that we're not really thinking about right now. All right, so rethinking meat and how we how we do things. I don't know if you any of you guys have tried a, the Impossible Hamburger. 
it's not quite as good, but boy, it's getting real close. And it's it's going to get closer and closer. And if they can if they can they can produce stuff like this, and they can produce it so it's tasty, the consumer likes it, and at a price the consumer can afford, you got yourself an opportunity there. And I think we're going to see a lot of that changing. That's happening also with with Impossible Milk and other things that are also being produced as well too. And there are also uh, cell factories which are have already produced the first two hundred thousand dollar hamburger from cell culture. Obviously, they got to get the price down, but I mean, stuff stuff is changing, and, and people are going to find opportunities, and companies are investing in this. All right, that almond I passed around to you guys. Hopefully, you all took a took a took a crunch out of that. You sampled one of those almonds. Everybody get an almond. Good, made it back. All right, when you ch when you chunked on one of those almonds, you just drank a gallon of California water that went into producing one of those almonds. Those almonds are produced in the Central Valley. Uh, that's a semi-arid area. In Arizona, for instance, they're producing alfalfa, which is a high water use crop, and they're shipping that alfalfa to Saudi Arabia right now to go ahead and feed their cows. We have what we call virtual water. It's the amount of water that actually goes into producing a crop. We have got to really rethink about how we're doing stuff, and that's gonna, we're gonna be forced to do that. 97% um, of the war, water in the world is saline. Less than 1% of the fresh water we have, the uh, lakes, aquifers, and what have you, is from fresh water. We only have about less than 1% of the actual world's water. So we're going to have to find ways of being able to go ahead and use desal more efficiently. That's going on in Saudi Arabia right now. That's going on in California. Uh, that's going on in Corpus. Corpus has all these multi-billion dollar uh, operations being set up with the steel industry and what have you, and other the, the number one uh, petroleum port in the, in the, in the U.S., and, and uh, they don't have enough water. So they're having, to, they're having to, to look at desalinated water. The efficiencies are not there yet. Uh, it's very high energy use. There are issues with membrane systems. But here's an example in, uh, in, in, in Australia, for instance. And if you're in a, in a dry area, a desert area that has access to water, and if you can enhance these efficiencies, there are opportunities which, which occur there. So what they're doing is they're actually using solar as a source of energy, the Saudis basically just use petroleum for going ahead and running their desalination. But they're using solar here to go ahead and get saline water and produce these truss, truss uh, tomatoes for, for, the, for the market there. This last thing I want to leave with you, this is number 12. This is when you, you, this is basically a package approach to how you do things. This thing's like really pretty low tech. But this technology is so important. It's, this is basically using drip irrigation systems. Uh, this is using high value crops. This is in Kenya. The company is called Amarin, which is the largest greenhouse, op greenhouse supplier in the region there. And they have gotten together with Swiss Reu. They've gotten together with a number of other companies. And what they've done is they've done a package approach. Because you just can't give people technology and, spec and expect them to run with the ball. They have to be shown how to do stuff. Mentorship is huge as far as that goes. Also, microfinance is very important as well, too. And these are small loans. They're only like $4,000 loans. There's what we call, I hate to use the word, there's skin in the game. Basically, they have to put 10% down, so they're not giving money away. They're going after young people, 35 and younger. I'm not qualified. But the whole idea is you're producing a high value stuff. You're using controlled environment agriculture, very simple controlled environmental agriculture with hoop houses, which are also insect screened to cut down on any use of pesticides. They're using drip irrigation systems there. They're also connected. They're connected to the, to the marketplace. It doesn't, if you just grow a whole bunch of food, you don't have, you don't have a market for it. You know, you're just wait, you know, it's, that's not what we want to be doing. It's gotta be market, market oriented and how, and how we do things. And I'm going to let Bannon go ahead and take it from here. This is basically just to kind of to show the complexity of what we're dealing with, but also the interconnectivity of what we're dealing with as well, too. And just the opportunities are there. And, and Bannon's going to kind of really wrap up with, with uh, some of our recommendations, and then we'll open up, open up to you guys to get some ideas on, on your thoughts on how we can scale things up. Bannon? Thank you, Fred. Yeah, this... Uh, graphic, don't take it too literally, I sort of drove that on an iPad, <clears throat> just trying to say that everything's sort of connected to everything else, and inter interrelated, it's a complexity, not, not uh, linear. Uh, Lynn could probably give more explanation of how that works. Um, but I think the connectivity is what's so critical here. It's, you know, the, 
we, we've talked, I've talked to World Bank people about the models of development and everything, and, and so much of the past was built sort of a very top-down, big projects, we're going to build a power plant, we're going to build highways or whatever, and now you have, because of this democratized technology and all the connectivity and all the things that, that Fred has talked about, you have a possibility of really a kind of a bottom-up, entrepreneurial-driven uh, ecosystem to, to pursue development, pursue the sustainable development goals. This is part of what we're talking about. And just to understand how this particular chart is, is, is don't take it too literally, but it was an e effort to try to demonstrate how all these things are, are uh, connected together. Uh, one of the, the uh, let's see here. So some of our key takeaways begin with is, is uh, Fred said at the beginning, when we don't see technology as a silver bullet, but it's it's necessary. It's I don't think we're going to make it through this century very well if we don't harness technology to solve these big grand challenges uh, and deal with SDGs and other other issues, and particularly on the food front. So it's it, it's going to be helpful, but how do we use it? And I think that part of, part of developing these urban food ecosystems is really trying to get all the stakeholders involved, from government people to the entrepreneurs, rural, urban, et cetera. And uh, this this is, I think, really important. To learn from the lo locals, where are the particularly where are the bottlenecks. You know, where's the problem? I I I, I dream of a one-click world. You know, I think that's Amazon's greatest contribution to the world. Uh, that you try to get all the inefficiencies out, so when you make it one click. You don't have to fill in your data every time. You don't have to, to worry about shipping. You just click on it once you once you find what you want to buy on Amazon. And I'm I'm a, a addicted a one clicker. But I think in the world, as you try to get rid of the bottlenecks, of course, as as uh, Fred said, the biggest bottleneck in meat is the cow. That's the bottleneck. All the, the raising of the cow, all the wasted, you know, the, the hooves, all this stuff that's wasted. If you could just grow the meat, it's a heck of a lot more efficient. And I think that's what we're seeing, the possibility of doing that. And there's something like 60 billion farm animals on the planet. And, you know, we're adding 2 billion people. Everybody wants to go up the food chain. It's unsustainable. The world be one big feedlot. So we have to find another way of producing high quality um, uh, protein, and particularly people like meat, people like fish, and I think that the we'll see in five or ten years that this is this is really where we're going to be going. And one point I make here is that you know there's the the Wayne Gretzky uh, statement. You know I don't go to where the puck is, but where it's going to be. So that's often people looking at technology. Where is it going to be in five years, ten years, fifteen years? And a friend of mine, Drew Net, Drew Andy from Stanford, added, "Yeah, that puck now has a little rocket motor on it, and it's accelerating." So when you try to think ahead where you're going, you got to think, well, where's the technology going to be? Where, what's going to be possible? And I think that's, we don't want to get stuck where we are now. That's why when we did this report, we're thinking, well, this is kind of a snapshot. But if we did the report a year from now, there's going to be more stuff going on here and better. And then five or ten years, it's going to be phenomenal. So I think as we think forward, the potential for all this, for the, the economic opportunities, the the opportunity to really try to address seriously the, the looming global food crisis as we have to produce 70 percent more food by 2050 uh, and we're doing it and, and it's going to have to be serving people in urban regions it's really critical so i think that you know trying to look at what 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 are sort of the general things that need to be done here and one of it is just infrastructure and, and starting with connectivity, but all the other infrastructure, the roads, the, all the potential and, and other kinds of, shall we say, smart policy infrastructure like rule of law, like protection of IP, like predictability, things that make it possible for an entrepreneur to start a business and feel confident that they can operate. Uh, getting rid of corruption is the other side of that. I think we see that producers, cooperatives, I should be sort of moving this forward. So we, we see this this mentorship. In fact, I think Fred especially has talked and having been a, taught at Texas A&M for so many years, I think he's especially focused on the question of, of teaching. But I think trying to, to encourage a new generation of urban farmers, urban food producers, that these could be good jobs, jobs that involve the tech savvy, if nothing else, if they're cell phones, if they're smartphones, that uh, kids can see, hey, I can make money, have a good job. I'm not going to be out there hoeing in the fields. I'm going to be someplace along the value uh, food chain value value chain uh, producing that this is really important and the mentorship and the lifelong learning I think for, that's true for everybody but it's going to be true in this case and because so much new stuff is coming down the line to make things actually better and easier faster 
Uh, and then some of these other things, just how do you integrate your, your food systems. And again, our, our effort was really to try to look at it as, a, as an overall ecosystem, starting with from the rural farmer all the way through the consumer in the city and see putting that whole thing together and how do we get all the inefficiencies out of it as, that we can and make it far more productive and, and um, uh, efficient. So I think it, in terms of some of the things for just for the for government, you know, if you were trying to go into a city, advise a city, well, what do we do here? You might start by gathering data, find out what does your existing food system look like? And I bet you there's not many cities that have much of a clue beyond more sort of generalities of where the food is produced, or how it moves, how it gets to the consumer from the producer. What's that whole map look like? So I think that would be a, a really good place to start. And now with the kind of data that's being produced by all kinds of means, uh, you know, the data is becoming increasingly accessible and, and you just need to figure out, Deloitte will figure out how to, to crunch the numbers for you in your city. And I think you need to really show a vision to the, to the senior leadership of the city and from people in government to business to in universities could be really helpful in this and so many cities do have universities and try to build a vision of what where you're trying to go and what the possibilities are what the potential is and how do you you know if, if you don't know where you're going any road will get you there as they say so how do you develop a system that you know you said look together and say well where would where we like to be that's possible and what do we do today to try to get to that that vision and if we want to produce more food locally and higher quality and head job well what do we do to get there and how do we educate our own people how do we develop an entrepreneurial culture etc so I think that that's that's the kind of thing that a city could work on together the stakeholders uh, to try to develop some kind of strategy and plan and and then implement the kind of government policies that would be uh, foster this the whole question of government is it you know what does it do to help and what does it do to get out of the way and uh, those are those are big questions, and uh, I think that has to be addressed by any any city. And of course, you want to build the capacity in the government to even understand what's going on, as well as in the private sector to even be able to assess these questions and ask the questions and help build the kind of outreach to to convince people that this is a good way to to, to pursue. So I think that you know this whole question of uh, uh, the urban farmers, as I said, how do you champion them? How do you uh, educate them and from the schools all the way to, to mentorships. Uh, I think that's critical. And another thing that's, that uh, people are not that aware of, I think, particularly in national governments in the United States, there are thousands of delegations that go between cities globally to learn from each other. And often I think federal governments are totally unaware of this. Uh, I learned about it about 15 years ago, and it was amazing to, to realize at that time there's all these delegations. So learning from each other is really critical. Sharing best practices, sharing ideas. This this is how you scale an approach like what we're talking about. If one city does it and tries to talk to others, say, hey, this really helped us move forward, then you start to really scale this. And the food valleys is just like a Silicon Valley, right? I mean, just how do you how do you encourage entrepreneurs that clusters develop and they learn from each other and you get people moving around like Silicon Valley that really advances technology. So there's other things you can do. Um, and I think one thing to explore is just prizes. The city can establish prizes to achieve certain goals for, from uh, our new innovations from, from people uh, addressing the whole food issue, the whole, whole uh, how do we get to the one-click world where everything moves efficiently and we get rid of the bottlenecks. So I guess that's where it sort of covers it. So we should get some, questions, get some feedback, some questions and some ideas. So please, please, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, Lynn Wells, George Mason. Um, I understand vertical agriculture can't handle grains and things like that, but what is the best combination of best combination of kind of vertical agriculture for selective things and other environments for places like Sierra Leone, badly threatened by climate change? Right. We could put together an integrated system of, of that would lead you to something like 365 growing seasons, kind of independent of El Nino, La Nina, things like that, for all the products they need. Right. Song. Song. Okay. I, great question. Um, what we really need to, in those types of environments, what we really need to be doing more of is looking at what we call controlled environment agriculture. Uh, it's, How's that? You have to eat it. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, it's what we call controlled, controlled environment agriculture. 
and there there can be very sophisticated systems like you know Dutch style houses to uh, to to vertical vertical production that I showed you, that I showed you for instance, and that's really that's really kind of pie in the sky, frankly, for the developing world. But there there are very good opportunities, cost effective opportunities that exist there for using controlled environment agriculture, where they're using hoop houses as an example, uh, which can they can be poly houses, they can also be shaded. Um, you're going to have to look at stuff like using uh, drip irrigation. Um, there are opportunities, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of sunlight in that part of the world. Uh, you know, they should they should be using they should be using things like solar irrigation pumps and what have you. The other thing, too, for instance, is going to locations where there is water that's available, that's feasible of being able to access. And frankly, I think what we should be talking about is uh, we should be talking about taking some of the world's agricultural land out of production that frankly is 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 uh, is non-productive that's causing environmental degradation of, of the land and we need to have better policy on this urban sprawl which is killing us from the standpoint it's taking out prime farmland all over all over the world it's, as national and international security uh, policy but to get back to your questions about controlled environment agriculture and how they might do things i think you you really want to look at a mixture of different things one of those is there will be certain environmental times, for instance, when they do have rain, where they can go ahead and they can plant certain things. But the other thing, too, for instance, about using drip and other, other more efficient forms of irrigation is it allows you to go ahead and extend your growing season in a period of time where normally there would not be reliable uh, rain. And I'm talking to the choir here. It's all supply and demand. If you can produce crops, for instance, reliably during the off-season, that's where you make your money. If you can produce crops during the off season, that's where you have a much better opportunity of not getting, not getting ripped off. So there are alternative uh, production systems which are, are available in that part of the world. But, yeah, I think also you so, well, could just you, you could address the question of grain. Yeah. And you know, I mean, in other words, there's things that you wouldn't grow in, in these uh, controlled environments. Well, uh, how would you how would you increase production of those uh, more locally? How how can we substitute for importing grain from Iowa? In our, uh, corn or whatever. There, there may be certain situations, for instance, where it actually makes sense to ship in certain product elsewhere, whether it's elsewhere in the country or elsewhere internationally. It's, it's all of what, what actually is, 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 is cost effective. Um, there, there are opportunities, for instance, of, and what we really need to be looking at is precision agriculture, um, uh, where, where we can go ahead and we can do a we can do a much a much better job, for instance, of producing crops. There's what we call no-till agriculture and what have you. And again, there's going to have to be there's mechanization involved in that, and that's really the direction we need to be going in agriculture interna internationally. It's got to be become more more mechanized, and there are smaller companies out there, business to businesses, which are starting to do that in India and Africa and, Cent and Central America. Let I just add here that. If you, so many of these countries are spending a huge amount of their wealth on importing oils and, and, and uh, energy. If you move towards the renewable energy, you're, you're eliminating that, that expenditure, which could be better spent on food, for example, than energy. And even the same thing, again, if you're, if you're manufacturing products locally uh, with 3D printing, et cetera, you're reducing the amount of stuff you're importing from China. So you can change your economic profile in a way that even if you are paying for importing food, you're less, it's a less of a drain on your country because you're, you're not spending on other things. And the other point I'd just say is part of our concern here is how do you build resilience in the face of climate change? I mean, there's, I, I, I'm worried there's going to be hundreds of millions of people who are going to be forced out of the literal cities as sea level rise and coupled with extreme weather are going to push them out of their cities, destroy them. But in any case, if you, if you trying to think forward, how do we create a resilient world where we're not dependent on a global system to get basic things like food or spare parts or, or energy, then the more you can produce these things locally, the more you can withstand the kinds of crises that are likely to come at us in the future. You're more resilient as a city if you're producing your own food. You're, you're less determined. Just think of the, the price increases on grain. What was it back in 2010? I think that led in part to the uh, Arab Spring, uh, because and then countries were hoarding their grain; they wouldn't they wouldn't export it uh, because they're afraid they were not going to have enough. So, if you could be you'd be more resilient from a national security point of view, I think if you move in this direction as well as 
uh, providing better food <laughs> and, and life for, for your own people. Good. Yeah. Any, Michael, please. Mike Nelson, uh, I've been working on internet policy for about 30 years. You said something really important, which is sometimes government needs to get out of the way. Uh, we always focus on the positive policies that governments are implementing, but sometimes they have to go in and get rid of an old rule that might be holding back the future. Or they have to quietly promote some technical standard. Or they have to do some pilot project that everybody looks to and says, whoa, wow, you can do that. I, I was in the Clinton White House and did the whitehouse.gov website. The whole world noticed for $300,000. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, do you have an example or two of where it would really do a lot of good for governments to fix a barrier that's getting in the way, or is there a pilot project that could change the way people think about technology and agriculture? And is there any international organization that's helping address those two issues, like FAO or someone else? <clears throat> um, USAID, for instance, does have does have some <clears throat> programs because they're they're very much interested in the, in the technology end of things, and and also. Uh, using using the web to go ahead and and, uh, and get in, get information out. Um, you know when you, when you talk about technology and policy, there are some other other basic policies that need to be looked at as well too. And I, I look at such things, for instance, as water rights, water use, land usage. If I'm a small holder farmer or a mid mid, mid holder farmer, and I'm not going to have access to that land next year, I'm not going to put money in the technology. And so those types of things also need to be addressed. And also, for instance, the problems of like in Africa, Africa, for instance, of, of uh, basically trade between one country versus another, the trade barriers which, which exist there. Um, and, you know, Vanny mentioned, for instance, the rule of law, those, those things that we kind of take for granted and what have you, those are huge, huge implements. And, and then also, too, from a policy standpoint, um, how we how we also handle disasters rather than you know when a disaster happens rather than flooding the market with a new with with product which kills the local producer there because he or she cannot compete with that mm -hmm. we really need to re rethinking a whole about, about this and that's one of the things I think that there are you know, like AID and some of these other international organizations are taking a look at how can we build resiliency so that for instance when an Ebola uh, problem happens, which which not only caused <coughs> tremendous disruption, for instance, in, in trade and what have you, but also caused tremendous hunger issues as well, too. How can we have greater resiliency to that? So I think people are looking at that. And if you want to answer any more about the... Uh, I'll just say, uh, I, I don't know specific examples, but an awful lot of countries try to control a whole telecommunications, which obviously uh, it becomes very anti-competitive. Very, I think Ethiopia only recently dropped it. I, I was in Ethiopia in 2012 as part of a global trends trip with the National Intelligence Council. And at that point, it was actually, I used it, but it was illegal to use Skype. Yeah. Um, and it was like you threatened with you know, 10 years in jail or something because you competed with the, the, the profits of the local telecommunications company, which was state owned, uh, which didn't want you to bypass their system. And so, you know, getting rid of some of these uh, state owned monopolies can be obviously very important. So it's, that's again, how do you spark competition, and how do you work with? I mean, you've got Google and others trying to, uh, and Virgin and uh, Musk, all trying to figure out ways okay. to bring internet to the last person. I have this. I used to think it was going to be Zuckerberg, and I don't know who it's going to be. It was going to be out there handing the last smartphone to the last person on the planet not connected, in you know, June twenty third, twenty twenty five. Well, I, I don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but at some point we, we have that. Well, that's got to be cheap. It's got to be big. It's got to be easy to get to. And uh, that's where governments can, you know, either help help it happen or really block it. Sorry, it. We have questions. Sir. So we, we can continue for ten minutes. Is that okay for you? Okay. We have one question there. Maybe we could take the two questions first. The lady in black. Great. Thank you. Hi. Sarah Dirks with the American Farm Bureau Federation. Very happy to be here today. Um, you highlighted a lot of issues, all this is very relevant to our world. One of the things you did not talk about and relating to government is looking at U.S. investment in ag R&D. And the last few years, 
U.S. investment has flatlined. Well, China's has grown exponentially. I'm looking at you thinking about, I know you have an innovation lab there at Texas A&M, and it's critical that, you know, we advocate for continued funding of these programs um, so that we remain competitive and we can continue to look at all the various things that have probably funded a lot of research you've done. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that um, and that need and how important it is. And yeah. Let me take another question before we answer. Maybe you could take the other question now and then. Benny and Fred would address uh, both together. Yeah, you, 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 thanks for your talk. Um, I, I really like to the World Bank. Um, you, you brought up the, the topic. Maybe it's not working. Oh, it is just too far. No, you need to turn it on. It has to be green. Okay. It's a sustainable, as as that switch, it's a sustainable mic. It has to be green. That's how you can make the mistake. Thanks, One click, plug it in, turn it over. Um, thanks for your talk. Emily can see with the World Bank. Uh, you brought up the, the topic of urban encroachment into farmland, and I wanted to come back to that. Um, it's probably not a lot of farmland that's at stake, but some strategic farmland. And certainly there have been efforts in many countries to protect strategic or prime agricultural land from conversion, uh, especially in this sort of urban sprawl or frontier. So I was wondering if you could come back to, to that and talk about um, the challenges you're aware of uh, in relation to that, maybe uh, different effective uh, roles for different levels of government, you know, from the national to the urban. Uh, any examples that you've seen that have been effective, particularly in, you know, the developing world, uh, it would be interesting. And by the way, thanks for not passing around uh, meat bowl, uh, <laughs> meat bowls uh, and almonds instead, despite them having much uh, larger water footprints. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for your questions. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. Um, in terms in terms of the uh, the question about uh, agriculture support, uh, that's a great question, and nothing makes me matter. Um, how how we've had this wonderful land grant system in this country, uh, which has made us the most efficient in the world. We went from 1900 of about 45 percent of the population working in agriculture to less than two percent that actually are involved in production agriculture. There are more people involved along the food chain other than that. But it's been the efficiency of this wonderful land grant system we have. And we have been underfunding this for the last 30 years. We're pretty much getting rid of our extension system. Uh, what's made us such a wonderful country in the world is, um, you know, when the Civil War was going on, uh, uh, basically uh, Lincoln and Morrill decided the only way we're going to really improve this country is public education. So they set up the land grant system. And then after that, they set up these wonderful research centers where we have extension programs. Uh, the the uh, the, the extension and also the uh, the research we have around the world, and we continue to underfund that, and that's a huge problem. And our productivity level has been maybe one or two percent for the last 25 years. So when we talk about productivity in other countries needing to get up to speed, we also need to look at our own. And that also that also relates to I think for instance of like how we use how we use land as well. To getting in the second question on ur urbanization, which I think is a very good question. This is not just an American problem. It's an international problem. Um, when I was in Indonesia, for instance, they were losing hundreds of hectares every year to urban, urban sprawl. And that's taking out prime farmland, farmland that's already good. We need to be really rethinking in the world. If we're gonna, if we're gonna sustainably feed another two billion people, how, how can we do this smarter? And we, you know, like vertical farming is cool. Controlled environmental agriculture is cool. And we gotta use all this stuff. But boy, we still need to use mineral soil when it comes to agronomic crops and, and producing uh, fruits and nuts and what have you. So we need to have much better public policy than we do. And I think that starts, for instance, at the national level. I think it starts at the national level. We need to have the, the discourse at the federal level. It also is at the state level. Uh, I grew up in the Garden State of New Jersey, which I did not appreciate until I showed up in Texas, because in New Jersey, we always you know, took for granted the high quality soil, water, and everything else. When I go back, I just cringe when I see all these warehouses and urbanization that's on this prime farmland and everything. And we really need to be rethinking that. There have been some state programs, for instance, which are set up because, you know, somebody's worked in farming all these years. Why shouldn't they be able to sell their land and make a profit for that? So maybe some buyback type things on the state level, federal level. But, you know, this urban sprawl, we're not going to totally, we're never going to stop it. But we need, to, we need to be having these green centers where we continue to go ahead and, and and, and grow crops sustainably. 
I, I'd just like to add, I don't know the extent of the uh, sort of convergence of high tech with agriculture, but I get the sense in, in Silicon Valley particularly that there isn't much interest in food and agriculture, although now there's interest in Impossible Burger and some of this. And yet, uh, you know, the, all these technologies that we show have a huge impact on our productivity and the quality and, and quantity of food produced here and around the world. And I was asked to speak at a conference three years ago in Dublin by the Food and Agricultural uh, Agency of the Government of Ireland. And they were releasing a report on bioeconomy, ag agricultural bioeconomy and technology 2035. And they've done an amazing job at looking at all these technologies and how they transform agriculture from CRISPR to, to robotics to self-driving trucks to uh, you know every kind of thing that kind of thing we talk about here. And this was Ireland. And they're thinking about how to, because they were saying, how are we going to sustainably produce more food for the world and for Ireland? And these people were very at the cutting edge. I mean, I was blown away by the technologies, which actually got me interested leading to this paper by seeing that God, there's huge opportunities here. The reason they had me speak was I was giving a talk on exponential technologies and the world and all that, not knowing anything about agriculture. And they were trying to show the farmers and the people who came to this international conference that, hey, all this technology development is going on elsewhere. Bring it to bring it to agriculture. Bring it to food, and I, which I hope was a successful mm -hmm. uh, effort. But that was Ireland, and I mean I, th I don't know if we've produced a paper like that from any U.S. government agency, but I was pretty impressed with what they did three years ago, and I think that. Bringing, getting interest in Silicon Valley and young young farmers here, young people to say, hey, this is a pretty challenging area, food, and, you know, bringing technology to it, advancing our own urban food ecosystems tied to our farms. So anyway, I, I don't know enough what, what's actually going on in this country to know whether this is we're, we're doing this well or not. But I certainly was impressed with what I saw. Any any other questions, comments? Yes, please. Um, I think we are, and working in this industry, it's we seem to be the hot widget right now. That everybody in Silicon Valley, from you know Jeff Bezos to every company up and down that coast, wants to work with ag, and so mm -hmm. we're seeing a huge influx of you know the the confluence of ag and tech, and it's hot. And so um, I think it's very encouraging for the future. So I want I don't know if it's a question or something for folks to think about, is where we've seen. Uh, a roadblock in the past, and something we're going to continue to struggle with, is consumer acceptance of technology. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think what's critical is we continue to communicate how these technology advancements will help us be more sustainable right. and will help us do these things, so we don't, um, so that we're able, we have the social license to continue to do so. So, just want to leave you with that or comment on it. Um, oh. and, and, and let me um, pose a question to you, Benny and Fred, considering the conversation here. But also considering that we have different realities around the globe. So you mentioned U.S. for sure, right? Uh, you mentioned Brazil. We have Tatiana from Brazil who worked with agriculture for a long time there. We have people from Europe, different parts of the globe. We talk about Africa. So let's imagine three different scenarios. The United States, let's say the largest food per country that most produces food in, in the globe, right? The second or third largest food producer in the global south, Brazil and Rwanda that someone talked. For each one of those scenarios, what is the one thing that you would bet with technology, or what's the opportunity, very quick? With technology? Yeah, considering the things that we have in the report, so it would say, hey, here in the US, this is the opportunity, in Rwanda, or like something like, what's the thing that you would bet on a place like Brazil? What's the thing that is in the report to pay attention? One one thing. Well, it's tough to do just one thing. <laughs> one for one for each scenario. Three different scenarios. Um, you know, Brazil does such a great. Brazil is actually putting a lot more money in, in into agriculture, uh, re, R and D, than we are in this country. Um, they. Um, I, I I think, for instance. I, w I would say, like in all, all the all the countries, one of the greatest opportunities is is actually going ahead, and and making making information more readily available to smallholder farmers. So, for instance, okay. they know they know, for instance, about Uber tractors. Um, they know about more of these business to business opportunities. And I think one of the things that needs to be done, 
and I would say really across all all three all, all three areas is really having a platform, more of a platform where people can go and get this get this kind of kind of information. And part of that also is with cooperatives, making sure that there are strong cooperatives who help with an aggregation of people so that there's better best management practices to microfinance, to connecting with markets, to making sure that the the quality specs are there with the, with the products they're producing. Okay, in all scenarios, connectivity, making information available, leveraging the technology to provide access to knowledge to people on the ground. Benny, your take. Oh, I, I agree with that. I don't have much to, alpha to add to it. I would suggest, if you haven't seen it, Netflix has a new movie called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And it's an amazing story. And I was blown away by it because I was at a Global Trends meeting in Botswana the Global Futures Forum in 2012, and the kid that's in that star of that movie was there explaining what he'd done. And he was in, if you see the movie, you'll realize how poor these people in Malawi were, are. And this kid figured out how to build a, a, a windmill, and he figured out how to have it generate electricity mm -hmm. so they could pump water and save the family. And he made it out of all these parts that he got out of a garbage, out of a dump. I mean, amazing story, but it goes back to the harnessing the technology to solve the problem. And I, if I have one general principle, it's focus on the problem or the opportunity. What are you trying to do? And then pull on whatever technology, business practices, you know, multidisciplinary approach to solving the problem. Keep the focus on the problem, not on the technology or any one business. And I think that's what you know we need to be doing globally. And that's what we tried to do with this report: is to look at the overall problem and say, how can you bring these things to bear to, to make the whole thing grow, make it more efficient, make it more, more productive. Okay. Three final comments from me. Thanks for coming. But my take on what you said in the conversation was knowledge matters. So oh, and yeah. providing access to knowledge really makes a difference. I think this is for sure we are all convinced about that. But I think it's important to stress. The second thing is that the U.S. Council on Competitiveness and Mike, Katie, and others, Josh, who are here, have been working a lot on the nexus connecting food, water, and energy, and let's say the relevance for R&D in that space. So I encourage everybody also to reach out and to share uh, what they're doing. And third is that in the GFCC, our global community, uh, in addition to food, there are other things related to knowledge, R&D, innovation that we've been working on. We would like to invite all of you to check that out, to stay in touch. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Benny and Fred, for this. Your work will continue. This, this conversation will be continued online and I hope also in person.